The woman was found dead in her home, and the police quickly solved the case. But what happened next is more like a twisted detective film than a real-life story. There are so many unexpected twists and turns in this case that it is rightly considered one of the most intriguing in history. Friends, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like it is very important to me. Donna Brown was born on November 10, 1963 in Miami. The girl grew up in a friendly and large family. She had two younger sisters with whom she got along well. When the girl was little, her parents divorced and Donna stayed with her mother. Despite this, her father continued to take an active part in the lives of his daughters and they remained close. After high school, Donna received her medical education and became an assistant surgeon at a local hospital. Her colleagues quickly fell in love with her because she was responsible for her work and was a kind and open person. Things were going pretty well for her, but to be happy, Donna wanted to start her own family. In the late 80s, she went on a date with a man named Mark Winger. It was almost like Donna knew she had met someone. Mark was charming and smart, worked as a nuclear engineer, and dreamed of having a large family. They began dating and in 1989 decided to get married. Soon after, Mark was offered a nuclear facility in Springfield, Illinois. It was a big step up for him, and he and the Donnies decided to move. The couple settled in a good area, and soon after the move, the woman took a job at the local hospital. He and Mark lacked only children to be happy, but all their efforts were futile. At some point, Donna learned that she was incapable of conceiving for medical reasons. It was a real blow to her. He and Mark both dreamed of a large family. All the conditions in their lives had this in mind, but fate did not. Then the couple began to think about adoption, but all the time postponed this serious step. It lasted until 1995, but one day everything changed. The hospital where Donna worked admitted a pregnant minor. The girl wanted to put her baby in a loving family and Mark and Donna made a decision. In June, right after the baby was born, they installed the girl and named her Bailey Elizabeth Winger. The day they took her home coincided with the anniversary of their engagement. The couple and all their relatives were happy to finally have a child. In August of that year, Donna and her three-month-old daughter went to Florida to visit their parents to finally meet their granddaughter. The family had a great time, and some time later, the woman returned home. She flew to the nearest airport, two hours from Springfield. Then she hired a taxi to her town through a special film. This ride really messed Donna up because the driver was acting pretty erratic. All the way, he was talking about how he had a bunch of personalities living in him, and they made him do all sorts of horrible things, like kill people. In addition, the driver said that he regularly participated in orgies and even invited Donna to participate in them. The man was also constantly violating traffic rules and driving a car is dangerous. When Donna came home, she told her husband and he was furious. Mark called the company the driver was working for and asked to be fired. It turned out that the driver was 27-year-old Roger Carrington. After the complaint, the management decided to suspend him from work, but it was not over. Over the next week, the winger's home phone received calls from an unidentified man who refused to introduce himself and asked for Donnie's call. She and her husband suspected that Roger was the caller and the woman was seriously concerned for her safety. Given that the man knew their home address, she feared Roger might hurt her. On August 29, the Springfield Police Department received an alarming call. Mark Winger said in a panic that a man broke into their house and attacked Donna with a hammer. The shocked husband took his gun and shot the assailant. Officers arrived at the house where they were waiting for a terrible spectacle. There were two bodies on the floor and Mark was there, panicked. The police felt the pulse of two people on the floor and called for an ambulance. While trying to find out what had happened there, Mark could barely speak but the detectives eventually managed to get a rough picture of what happened. Mark said he was working on a treadmill in the basement, and at some point he heard a noise upstairs. He went up to the ground floor and saw his three-month-old daughter lying on her parents' bed, unsupervised. He walked into the other room and saw an unidentified man throwing a hammer at his wife. After panicking, Mark grabbed his gun and shot his attacker. He called the police. 
While the officers waited for the ambulance, one of them took the wallet from the attacker's jacket. There were documents in the name of Roger Carrington. The detective knew the man well. Roger lived in a trailer park in Springfield and had a rich criminal history, mostly involving petty crime. He also had a history of mental illness and was generally quite aggressive. Roger and Donna were taken to the hospital where they died shortly afterwards without regaining consciousness. Meanwhile, the police were searching the crime scene for evidence. Next to the bodies was a hammer covered in blood and Mark's gun was on the table, along with a pack of cigarettes and a cup of coffee. Mark told the detectives that the killer most likely brought cigarettes and coffee. The hammer was from his toolbox and the man had to hang some paintings that day, so he cooked it up and left it in the living room. Roger's car was found near the Winger's house and a note was found inside. It had Donna's home address on it, along with Mark Winger's name and 4.30 p.m. Detectives asked Mark if he knew his attacker. At first, the man replied in the negative, but when the police called his name, Mark was horrified to learn that the killer was the same driver. He told the detectives the story of their acquaintance with Roger, his strange behavior with Donna, and the creepy calls to their home number. Investigators talked to acquaintances and relatives of Donna who were aware of her concern. The woman repeatedly complained to them that she feared Roger seriously and was afraid that one day he might come to her home and take revenge. After complaining to his superiors, the man lost his job. Donna even wrote down all the details of her trip with Roger on a piece of paper in case she had to go to the police. The police officer also found this leaflet in their home. The investigation lasted two days after which the case was closed. Mark was never charged for shooting Roger because his actions were classified as self-defense. The man continued to be in shock. His relatives flew to Springfield to support him and help take care of his daughter. Donna's family was also very helpful. As the months passed, Mark still suffered the loss of his wife and his loved ones began to notice negative changes in his behavior. He became a frequent drinker, although he had almost never consumed alcohol before these events. The man also often visited local bars. His relatives tried to support him in every possible way and help take care of Babe. But eventually, they all had to return to their cities. Donna's parents realized that Mark would have a hard time caring for her daughter and offered to find a nanny. The man eventually hired a woman named Rebecca who specialized in 24-hour childcare. So she spent most of her time in their house. Rebecca took care of the girl and got along well with her. Mark slowly recovered, stopped drinking and returned to work. This went on for several months during which time he and Rebecca began an affair. The woman practically never left his house, spending time with Bailey, communicating constantly and ultimately resulting in mutual sympathy. Rebecca also sincerely loved the girl and a strong bond was formed between them. In 1996, a woman became pregnant and Mark once again had a chance to have a large and strong family. Rebecca wanted the same, and in October the couple married. Mark and Donna's relatives were surprised that the man had a new relationship just months after his wife's death. But in the end, they supported him as the new family benefited not only him, but also Bella. All of Rebecca's relatives were very sympathetic to her, seeing her sincere love for the girl and her care. Mark decided to sell his house because he was constantly reminding him of Donna's death. And after what happened, he didn't want to raise kids there. He and Rebecca decided to buy a house with a large plot of land outside the city. They made repairs there and began to build their new life. Soon they had a girl and in the next few years, the couple had another daughter and a son. So Mark and Rebecca raised four children and the man's dream of a big family finally came true. Over time, Mark became increasingly estranged from Donna's relatives, who tried to be present in her granddaughter's life. The problem was, Bailey didn't remember Donna at all and thought Rebecca was her mother. Mark didn't want the girl to know their family's tragic past from a young age, and eventually he forbade Donna's parents to call her their granddaughter. They tried to convince him, but in the end, they gave up all attempts. The family understood that the girl could really be better off if she grew up aside. In the following years, Mars and Rebecca happily lived in their new home. 
raising their children and making plans for the future. The tragedy of the past was gradually forgotten, but its echoes haunted the family to this day. In 1999, Mark decided to sue the company that had hired Roger Harrington as driver. In the opinion of the man, the management made no effort to test this man for sanity, and that led to the murder of his wife. The company didn't want to admit it, so Mark hired a lawyer. In order to determine their guilt, the court had to examine all the materials of the case, and they were transferred with the evidence to lawyers. While they were preparing for the trial, something unexpected happened. In February of that year, a woman named Diane Schultz came to the police and told the detectives a shocking story. Diane was Donna's best friend and worked with her in the hospital. When she had a child, the woman actively helped her look after the girl, but Diane's story changed everything. She admitted to the police that she and Mark had had an intimate relationship that they had been hiding from their spouses for months. It all started three months before Donna's death, almost at the same time that the couple installed their daughter. Mark and Diane were secretly dating, but it was just the tip of the iceberg. The woman told the detectives that Mark wanted to get rid of his wife to be with her. A man once said it would be so much easier if Donna just died. He then began to persuade Diane to help him execute a plan, but did not reveal its details. Mark said that Diane would just have to come to the house, find his wife's body, and call the police. The woman thought that Mark could not say such things seriously and just joked, but Mark continued to share with her disturbing thing. After Donna complained to him about Roger Harrington's behavior, he told Diane and said that he planned to frame the driver. The man added that all he had to do was find a way to lure him into the house. A week later, the day of the murder, he called Diane and asked her if she would love him no matter what. The woman said yes. A few days after Donna's murder, friends and family gathered at their house to support Mark. When the man was alone with Diane, he said he thought the police believed me. I did it for us. The woman was shocked, but Mark asked her not to say a word to anyone, and she listened to him. After that, they continued to meet secretly and even exchanged rings, planning to marry in the foreseeable future. But in the following months, Mark began a romantic relationship with the nanny and eventually broke up with Diane. The woman was depressed. For Mark's sake, she kept this terrible secret, and in the end, he traded it for another. Diane never dared to tell the police, however, because she knew that part of the blame lay with her. Over the next few years, the woman tried repeatedly to take her own life, and it was only three and a half years before she resettled herself and came to the police station. The detectives were in total shock. All this time, Mark was considered a victim and even a hero who tried to save his beloved wife from a terrible killer. But Diane's story changed everything and the cops took a whole other angle on this case. The investigators decided to re-examine the evidence, but here they were facing an unpleasant surprise. They were all handed over to the lawyers who were preparing the case of Mark against the carrier company. It took time to claim them back. Some of the case files are still at the station. They were photos from the murder scene. The lead detective looked at them and realized with horror that all these years they had not noticed the obvious thing. Immediately after the murder, the investigation was quickly closed as no one doubted Roger's guilt. But now, when the detective first picked up these photos, he realized that the disposition of the bodies was completely inconsistent with Mark's story. The man told him that when he entered the room, Donna was lying on the floor and the perp struck her with a hammer from above. Then he shot him and Roger fell next to the woman. In fact, his body was lying in the opposite direction and the man simply could not physically fall in that direction. The detective realized that Mark's story was a lie and it forced him to rethink a whole series of moments that now made more sense. First of all, no one ever figured out how Roger got in the house, no sign of forced entry, and Donna definitely wouldn't have opened the door for him. But if you think about the note inside Roger's car, it all makes sense. Mark's name and time were on it, which was like a reminder of the meeting. Recollecting Diane's story, the detective admitted that Mark, under some pretext, called Roger to their home and let him in and then shot him. Second, Roger's car contained a knife and several other items he might have used to kill him. 
but he didn't take them with him, and he used Mark's hammer, which the man took out of the closet that day and left in plain sight. It all sounded completely illogical, assuming that Roger came to their house with the intent of murder. In fact, he left a pack of cigarettes and a paper cup of coffee on their desk. A very strange act on the part of the man who came there to kill. The detective overheard the recording of a 911 call made by Mark. Here he was again, shocked. Mark told the cameraman that he had shot his attacker once. After that, a man's indistinct muttering was heard in the background. It was as if someone was trying to talk. Mark told the cameraman that his daughter was crying. He had to go to her. Then he hung up, but on the recording, there is no hint of a baby crying. Much more realistic was the next scenario. Mark did shoot Roger once. Donna came running to the sound of the shot and her husband hammered her. After that, he called the police and with a mock panic reported the incident. Suddenly, Roger woke up and tried to say something. That sound got on the phone. Mark lied about his daughter crying, hung up on the phone and shot Roger again. In support of this version, there was another fact that was completely ignored by the investigators. Mark and Donna's neighbors said they heard two gunshots during the interview. However, about five minutes passed between them. This did not go with Mark's story at all, but completely fell under the more realistic version in which he was the killer, but that's not all. In the first investigation, which lasted only two days, the experts did not even examine the evidence. But now that Marks decided to sue the shipping company, they've hired lawyers to win the case. The lawyers requested an independent examination of the clothes of all three participants in the event. The results spoke for itself. The spatter and traces of blood indicated that Mark's story had nothing to do with reality. According to him, Roger struck Donna with a hammer, except that there was not a drop of her blood on his clothes. Even the smallest, but on Mark's clothes, there was plenty of his wife's blood. It clearly indicated that he was the one who killed his wife. The police took the evidence from the lawyers and did their own analysis, showing exactly the same result. As a result, the police reopened the investigation. Only this time, it was a double murder in which Mark became a suspect. His family was shocked. No one believed a man was capable of such a brutal crime. Donna's family reacted skeptically to Mark's suspicions until they heard what the detectives had dug up. The only people who ever insisted on Roger's innocence from day one were his friends and family. They were all aware of his light criminal history, but they didn't believe he was capable of murder. Moreover, Roger's roommate, with whom they rented accommodation, initially gave the police important information that they had missed. Right after the murder, detectives interviewed the man. He said that the day before, Roger had received a call. After he hung up, he wrote down the address, name of Mark Wenger and the time. It looked like Mark was making an appointment for him, but the police didn't think much of it. Rebecca was most shocked by the situation. Knowing Mark as a loving and caring father who had never shown any aggression during their entire life together, she refused to believe that this man could have hammered his wife and framed another. After several weeks of investigation, the police decided to arrest Mark. He was detained at work and the case was sent to court. A bail of one dollar million was set for the man. He could not find such a sum, so he was in custody pending trial. The trial did not begin until three years later, in May 2002. Everyone close to him, even Donna's family, hoped that this would be one big misunderstanding and that the court would prove Mark's innocence. None of them were prepared to the contrary. His lawyers insisted on Mark's version. They noted that the crime scene photos could have been taken after the paramedics moved Roger's body. Given that doctor's actions were not documented and it was impossible to prove or disprove this possibility. Lawyers also focused on Roger's criminal history, his mental problems, and inappropriate behavior with Donna during the trip. The main witness in this case was Diane Schultz. By law, she could have been punished for hiding Mark's secret all these years. But the judge decided to grant her full immunity in exchange for her testimony. The man's lawyers tried to discredit Diane, pointing out that the woman repeatedly tried to take her life which may indicate psychological problems. Legal also assumed that she made it all up out of jealousy to get back at Mark. 
the prosecution insisted that Diane's evidence and testimony implicated him. As for motive, the answer was in the lover's story. Mark lost interest in Donna long before they adopted Bailey. He had a secret relationship with her best friend, but he couldn't divorce Donna. In that case, he would have to share an expensive house and other property with her, and that was unacceptable to Mark. After Roger drove Donna from the airport, Mark saw the perfect opportunity and decided to act. As creepy as that sounds, the man is really lucky. He got a man with a criminal record and a mental illness who talked about voices in his head calling for people to be killed. After complaining to the management, Roger lost his job, and that was the perfect motive. When the prosecution and the defense put their cards on the table, all they had to do was wait for the jury to decide. Despite the very convincing evidence against Mark, his guilt was still questioned by both his family and donors' relatives. None of them could picture a loving father and a respected member of society as a murderer. However, the jury unanimously found him guilty of double homicide. In the end, Mark was given life without parole and Roger was posthumously acquitted. Rebecca couldn't believe her husband actually killed Donna. It took her a long time to consider all the evidence against him impartially. Until finally, the woman came to terms with the idea that he really was the killer. The lead detective has repeatedly apologized to Donna and Roger's families for how carelessly the initial investigation was conducted. He admitted his guilt for mistaking the most logical version of what had happened for the only right one, overlooking all contradictions. If you think this is the end of the story, I have another unexpected turn for you. Even after the verdict, many had doubts whether Mark had actually done all this, but in 2006, these doubts were dispelled. They found 19 pages of handwritten text in Mark's prison cell, in which he had a plan to kill Diane and another person. Mark wanted to hire a hitman straight from prison through other prisoners or people on the outside. The desire to kill Diane was understandable. He wanted to get back at the woman for revealing all his secrets to the police. The second person on the list was a man named Jeffrey, his friend from early childhood. Detectives quickly figured out the reason for this decision. Mark asked him for $1 million to post bail, but a friend refused to provide the amount. These handwritten pages showed that Mark not only wanted to kill the man, but also to get a substantial ransom for him before that. Why he needed the money for life is unclear. He may have planned on escaping or escaping sooner or later, but in the end, the man again presented himself in court and received an additional 35 years in prison for planning a double murder. After that, no one doubted that it was Mark who killed Donna. Rebecca raised four kids alone, and now they all know what a monster their father is. They've changed their names and have no plans to contact Mark. In 2019, Rebecca decided that Bailey should resume contact with Donna's relatives, who had not seen her since she was three years old. Bailey was 24 at the time, and she went to Florida and had a great time with them. They still talk, and the girl learns more about Donna from them. As for Mark, he is still in prison and denies his guilt. Perhaps he would never have been held responsible for what he had done, but for two factors that had occurred almost simultaneously. One, this is his ex-lover's statement. She could no longer keep this secret, especially watching the killer create a new family and raise children. The second factor is Mark's greed. Almost four years after the murder, he decided to sue Robert's employer for a sizable sum. Although he earned a very good salary, apparently, he didn't expect outside experts to examine the evidence much more thoroughly than local detectives. It is noteworthy that Diane decided to go to the police, including after she learned of this lawsuit. It was one of the last drops and the woman revealed Mark's terrible secret. Share your opinion in the comments and do not forget to like under the video if you liked it. I also recommend subscribing to the channel where I publish the most interesting criminal news from around the world. Thank you for watching.